hundred thousand dollars. I don't have the hundred thousand to buy it. Islamic Bank says no problem. Islamic Bank says we'll buy it for a hundred thousand and then we'll sell it to you for four hundred thousand. What did you say? Huh? I didn't hear you. We'll buy it for a hundred thousand and we'll sell it to you for four hundred thousand. Huh? Why would I buy from you for four hundred thousand when it's on sale for a hundred thousand? If I have to buy from you cash, then someone should make an appointment for me with a psychiatrist. Huh? I, I'm, I'm mentally unsound. No, 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 you're not buying from me cash. It's a credit transaction. Oh, I see. So I pay you 400,000 and you give me 20 years to pay. Why am I paying an extra 300,000? Why? There's only one honest answer to that question. There's only one honest answer to that question. All the rest belong to the garbage bin. The only reason why I'm paying an extra $300,000 is because you've given me 20 years to pay. That's the only reason. And so time equals money. You are earning money through time and that is riba. But Islamic Bank says, no, there's no lending of in money here. There's no loan. This is murabaha. Murabaha, where both the buyer and the seller agree on the selling price with an increase. Murabaha. No, it ain't murabaha. It's backdoor riba. Around the world today, <laughs> Islamic banks, Islamic financial institutions are peddling murabaha and declaring that this is a halal transaction and there are no shortage of muftis. If you're not, if you are comfortable with this murabaha, I have not been appointed to stop you. No. But those of you who can see that this is backdoor riba, you would avoid it. They didn't get you to the front door, so they won't get you to the back door. And then there is that other famous method of hiding the riba in a lease. <laughs> a lease. But the, the interest is embedded in the lease contract. The price at which you are leasing the article includes the interest in the price. And so where you think that this is a straight lease contract, a rental contract, it is more than that. It is a rental contract in which the riba is incorporated into the rental price. Do not therefore allow yourself to be trapped by backdoor riba. If we do this, if we borrow on interest, or if we lend on interest, put our money in a fixed deposit. Let me quote the last hadith and we'll now end. What are the implications for us? They can't change this hadith. No. This is Sahih hadith. The Prophet Muhammad wasalam, cursed all four. And he said that they're all equally guilty. He cursed all four. And he said that they were all equally guilty. The one who takes riba. The one who gives riba. The one who records the transaction. And the two witnesses. And he said they're all equally guilty. If they're all equally guilty, what is the implication? What is the punishment? What is the punishment for the one who is taking riba? Hmm? It is there in the last revelation. Woman Ada Faulaika Oshabunar Humfiha Khalidun. 
if you are taking riba, even after this revelation has come, then not only do you belong to the hellfire, but more than that, you remain there forever. Forever. That is the punishment for the one who is taking riba. What is the punishment for the one who is giving riba? He borrowed money on interest to buy a house. And even after this lecture, he would not make toba. He would not go back home and sit down with his wife and say, we have committed sin. We must get out of this. We must make toba. We must take, seek istighfar from Allah. And we have to get out of this riba as soon as we can. No, 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 no. He's not convinced. He still continues to write the check every month to pay the interest and to pay the mortgage. The Prophet said that his sin is equal <laughs> to the one who is taking riba. What about the one who is working in the bank and recording the transactions? His sin is equal to the one who is taking riba. What about the one who is witnessing the transaction? His sin is equal to the one who is taking riba, the money lender. If their sins are equal, then it follows that the punishment must be equal. They will all enter into the hellfire and they'll remain therein forever. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may look kindly upon us and help us as we seek to understand this subject and may look kindly upon us and forgive us for what we have done in the past and may look kindly upon us and help us as we try to lead our lives free from riba. Are there any circumstances in which riba is permissible? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given into the, in the Qur'an the principle of darura or necessity that when a situation arises which qualifies as darura then it is permissible for a Muslim to eat lahmul khinzir, pork in order to stay alive. Therefore, insofar as the prohibition of riba is concerned, where a Muslim is faced with <coughs> a situation where there is no way out for him, none whatsoever, he can apply the principle of darura. But if there's a way out for him, if he can leave Sydney and go to Melbourne and get food, food is available there. He cannot eat pork in Sydney. No. It is when he can't go anywhere to get food. Nowhere. Only then he'll have to eat the pork. So if there's any place on Allah's earth where you can go, and avoid being in riba, directly in riba. Of course, the dust you cannot escape from. Then it is obligatory and upon a Muslim, before he employs the principle of darura, to try to find some place on Allah's earth where he can live with his religion. The Prophet said, Islam, the time will come when a man would have to flee to the mountainside to save his deen and take some sheep and goats with him. In a, in a Surah Al-Nisa, in Surah Al-Nisa there's an ayah. The angels have taken the souls of a people who have committed sin against their own souls. And these people are being taken to Jahannam. And the angels pause and they ask, Fima kuntum? What happened to you that you landed in this mess and you're heading for Jahannam? These people reply and they said, well, we had no alternative. There was no way out for us. Kunna mustada'afina fil ard. We were helpless. There was no way out. To which the angels respond and they say, alam takun ardullahi 
wasi'ah fatuhajiru fiha was Allah's earth not wide that you could have traveled on Allah's earth to find a place where you would be able to preserve your deen. It is only when that option is also closed to you. You cannot even go to the mountains <laughs> huh? with some sheep and goat. Nowhere can you escape. Only then can you enforce the principle of necessity. This is not like food. Food without food for 24 hours, 20, 48 hours, you become helpless. There if you have no food and you're dying, then you can eat the pork. Any other questions? Yes. If the person Salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum. If the person used to be a Christian or came from some other religious background and they bought a flat or a house of some sort and then they became Muslim, what's the best thing they should do? Whether you are a Christian or whether you are a Muslim and you bought the flat or the house. Hmm? Allah says, فَمَنْ جَاءَهُ مَوْعِذَةٌ مِنْ رَبِّهِ فَانْتَهَا Whosoever, having now received the guidance and the warning tonight in this masjid, فَانْتَهَا They now make the intention to get out of that riba. Hmm? And having made the intention, you now proceed with full speed ahead to try to get out. فَلَهُ مَا سَلَفْ وَأَمْرُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ hmm? If you had made any gains, any profits through riba in the past, you're not required to give it up. The Islamic State will not come after you for that. And your case is now transferred to Allah's court. If, however, having heard the lecture, you still remain in your riba, <laughs> Hmm? So the first thing you must do is to make the niyyah in your heart. Oh Allah, I recognize that I have committed a mountain of sin by entering into riba. I seek your forgiveness and I make tawbah to get out of it. And having made the intention, you now proceed to make the best effort that you can to get out as soon as you can. Yes. Um, you mentioned lease and rental. Um, obviously, you sold your house now. Come to Allah, but then you go into a rental. All right. I have been renting an apartment in New York. I lived in New York for ten years, in Miami for one year. Never bought a house. It was a two-bedroom apartment, and I was paying one thousand. US a month in rent in New York. <coughs> but I know <laughs> that that 1000 that I'm paying includes my landlady's riba because she bought the house with a bank loan on interest. So I am paying her riba for her. <laughs> so I am in the indirectly involved in riba. When a Muslim is faced with two evils and there is no way out, he must always choose the lesser evil. But as soon as an opening comes for him to get out of all the evil, he must get out. So although I was a former diplomat, although I've attended five universities in my life, I had a superb education, I never earned more money than just to pay my bills. So I could never save anything. Hmm? It's only when Allah helped me and my books were written, all of these books. And then I burnt my books and I said, let me travel around the world. And if Allah so wills and the books sell, then I might be able to get enough money to buy a little piece of land. Allah has helped me and I now have the money to buy the land. Okay, and now I say, maybe Allah will help me, I get enough money to put up a small house, very small house. This is where I am now. So as soon as I have enough means to put up a small house, 
I'm not renting anymore. Hmm? Until I don't, until I have the means to put up the smallest of house, I have no alternative. I have to rent, but I'm in indirect riba. Yes. Uh, why? Why do I have anything to do with the owner? He's paying riba. I got nothing to do. On judgment day, I'm not going to judge for what he does. I'm going to pay rent. Yeah, the owner has entered into direct riba, so the owner will have to answer for that contract with the bank. Okay. But I must not close my eyes to the fact that I am not paying the market rental value. If the economy was not based on riba, the rent that I would be paying would be by maybe six or seven hundred dollars a month. But because the, the house was bought with a bank loan on interest, the market rental value has gone up. You see? So I have to recognize that I am indirectly in riba, but because I have no alternative, I don't have the means to be able to get a home of my own, even the smallest one, I have to stay with the lesser evil. But as soon as I get the smallest home, I get out of even the lesser evil and I have no riba, yes. The question is, in a business transaction, you have the possibility of a profit or a loss. In a riba transaction, there is no possibility of a loss. What I could have done was to say not only is the bank immunized from loss, but the bank also minimizes to the minimum extent possible the possibility of a loss. So you have to bring collateral, you have to sign a mortgage. Hmm? So the, in the event that you default on your contract with the bank, the bank can seize your property, seize whatever has been mortgaged and ensure that the bank does not suffer loss. In fact, when the bank takes your house, they usually sell it at a sweetheart deal. So your bank does not care to sell your house at the market value of the house. And you have to pay the bank whatever is outstanding on the loan, even for the future that you're not using. Even that has to be paid. And then if there's anything left, that you'll get. Yes? I think you better use the microphone so that everybody can hear. Is it halal to buy and sell shares in a stock market? At the back of my book on the prohibition of riba in the Quran and Sunnah, the big book, you will see a section in which there are questions and answers. The popularly que asked questions. Among them is this question, so you'll see my answer there in that section of the book. <coughs> A stock market in an economy which is not based on riba is a halal institution. In Islam we have a transaction which is called mudaraba. Excuse me. I have capital. I would like to invest it. You have a business. You manufacture carpets, you import carpets from Iran. You have a shipment of carpets coming for which you have to pay $100,000. Instead of going to the bank to borrow the 100000 to pay, okay? I say to you, I will invest in your business in, insofar as this shipment is concerned. So I give you the capital. But I am not involved in the business itself. You are in charge of the business. When the carpets arrive, if they are sold, and uh, we make a profit from that, I share with you in the profit. That's called mudaraba. This is about the same principle involved 
in the stock market that a business has a certain value and you divide that value into parts and you buy now a part of the business if the business makes a profit then you get a share in the profit the business suffers a loss you share in the loss by investing by buying shares in this company you are not yourself involved in running the company they have a shareholders meeting yes in which you uh, adopt policies and so on but you're not involved in the direct running of the business but when the stock market is not operating free from riba or free from haram then we have problems i'm buying shares in microsoft and microsoft is producing uh, computers and software and so on and uh, we said but there's nothing haram in this okay all right if we make an examination of all the products and we find there's nothing haram in it we have to ask ourselves now is microsoft borrowing and lending money on interest if microsoft is itself borrowing and lending money on interest then it will be haram for me to invest in Microsoft. If you can find any company in the stock market which is not borrowing or lending on interest, you better look at it very carefully because it's not going to last for long. Oh no, you're not supposed to exist. They will destroy you as soon as they know that you are a company not borrowing and lending on interest. Hmm? Secondly, you have to look at the product that the company is manufacturing. The company is manufacturing alcohol hmm? and you invest in that company. Then of course the profits or the dividends paid will be haram for you. The third and perhaps most difficult part of all in analyzing today's stock market is that the value of a company and therefore the value of its shares is subject to speculative attacks hmm? there's something called the grapevine <laughs> and news travels through the grapevine and the reason why we make all these contributions to this political party and that political party and this fellow running for mayor and this fellow running for municipal councillor is because we are making investments to get news, information. Information means money in the market. Mm -hmm. We want access to information. This is called insider trading. The insider trading is what really is reaping all the profits in the stock market and the rest are only donkeys <laughs> they're just donkeys in the market hmm? the rest are there to make the stock market look civilized look respectable while the insiders are ripping off the market speculative transaction is a transaction in which you buy anticipating that the price would rise hmm? When it rises, you then sell and you make a killing. Or you sell anticipating that the price would fall and when it falls, you buy back and you make a killing. Hmm? If your analysis is based on, on valid economic criteria, hmm? valid econo economic criteria, then there is no Horma in buying because I believe property rises, property prices are going to rise, or there's going to be a greater demand for this and so on. And that's a legitimate profit. But when you're purely speculating, it now becomes a, a, a cousin of gambling. And that, unfortunately, is the stock market today and the currency market today. It is a big Las Vegas all around the world. Okay, I'm sorry this answer had to take so long. You have a question? Mashallah, come on. How, how do you know that 
They, they fix the price themselves, the US government. They fix the price at $35. In fact, if we want to be more specific with the answer, I'll have to tell you that the US government has no control over the money. It is something called the Federal Reserve. <laughs> They're the ones who fix the price. Huh? They fix the price of gold at 35 but then, between 1944, when Bretton Woods was concluded, to 1973, the price moved from 35 to 40. Guess what happened in 1973? The war. The Ramadan War, also known as Yom Kippur War. And then King Faisal Rahimahullah imposed the oil boycott. That was before some of you were born, eh? Oil boycott on the United States. When Uncle Sam was slapped with his oil boycott, guess what happened to the US dollar? It collapsed by 400%. It was 40 and it became 160, which is a very plain and clear indication of the vulnerability of the US dollar. The second instance was in January 1980 after the Iranian Revolution. In fact, we know the, the exact date. It was the 15th of January 1980 when the market was afraid that the Iranian Revolution might be exported into the Gulf. And the US dollar fell to 850 US dollars to one ounce of gold, indicating the vulnerability of the US dollar. So when the attack comes, which I am anticipating is going to come soon, during this summer while I was touring Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore, in my public lectures I was saying I expect it to come within the next five to ten years. But after September the 11th, I think I have to expect it even earlier than that. Is it permissible for a Muslim to inherit from a non-Muslim? Why? Because the Muslim, if he is to pay even minimum attention to the concept of purity, purity, has to ensure that what goes into his stomach is halal. Because that can affect your spiritual state. The clothes that you wear must be halal. <laughs> the non-Muslim may not be earning halal. He does not have Allah's law by which he can determine what is halal and what is haram. If you inherit from him, the first and the most dangerous possibility, therefore, is that you may be inheriting that which is haram and consuming that which is haram. If it is not permissible to inherit from a non-Muslim, how can it be permissible to accept charity from a non-Muslim. In a condition of darura, yes, you can even accept pork. So my answer does not apply to situations of darura. My answer applies to situations which do not qualify as darura. A Muslim, therefore, in order to ensure that whatever he consumes is halal, must ensure that whatever he accepts is also halal. Yes? I've heard of a movement in North America and Europe known as uh, Moral Reform that are uh, reviving this uh, concept of real money. Could you perhaps shed some light on that? I met with Sheikh Abdul Qadir in Cape Town in October for the first time. And I met with Omar Vadilio, 
in Cape Town in October for the